Hi guys, good evening. So I am Yana Baba, Professor of Zoology, Axie.com online course. So let us continue about the classification of uh, invertebrate groups. So the last class we have seen the various types of invertebrate groups. We have completed up to the flat bones. Now let us proceed with the ascalmentus, the round bones. And if you are taking these animals, the animal's body normally is cylindrical and circular in cross section. So actually we can say, if we are making a section of these animals, we have two circles, outer side and then inner side. So this is the outer circle and this one is the inner side. So we can say a tube within a tube system of organization. So in the case of animals, these animals, we have a tube within a tube system of organization because we have an outer circle of that is the body wall and the inner circle of the gut or the alimentary canal. So in all cases if you make a cross section of these animals they are all circular in cross section hence the name that is the round bones. And if you are taking the habitat, the mode of living, the habitat and also the habit and the mode of living. So if you are taking the habits of these animals the animals may be aquatic or terrestrial and some of them are free living and some of them are parasitic. So this is the mode of living on the habits. Now let's proceed further and go to other characteristics. So this is a general category you know that one starting from flat worms and up to the arthropods we have bilateral symmetry. The animals are triploblastic. Then one peculiar character for these animals, there is no true coelom present. Hence, these animals are considered as a pseudo coelomate animals. Now, what is the nature of this pseudo coel? So, normally we have two types of coelom during development. One coelom, what is called the embryonic coelom. The embryonic coelom, namely the blastocele. So the blastocele of the blastula is considered as the embryonic coelom and that body cavity of that coelom actually that is actually the embryo is primary body cavity. The cavity found in the case of embryos particularly in the case of blastula the blastocele that is called the embryonic body cavity that is called the primary coelom and during further development that primary coelom gets transformed into a secondary coelom which is the adult coelom. But in the case of these round bones, what will happen? So during development, for example, in the case of blastula, we have the cavity, the blastocele. This is the blastocele, the cavity, the primary body cavity or the embryonic body cavity. It didn't get transformed into the adult seal. There is no transformation of this blastocele to form the adult seal, what we call this one as a secondary seal. So it remains as it with some modifications. That is why the pseudo or the pseudo seal is nothing but the remains or the remnant of the blastocele. This is an examination point of view. So what is actually the nature of the pseudo in the case of Ascalmindus or the round bones? So it is nothing but the remnant or the remains of the blastocele. The blastocele never gets transformed into the adult coelom, it remains as such even in the adult and that remnant of blastocele is called as a pseudocelum or the pseudocele. So what is the nature of the body cavity in the case of round bones? That is nothing but the remnant of the blastocele. Now, so some of the animals are parasitic in nature, what I mentioned. If you are taking the body wall, there are certain peculiar characteristics. If you take the body wall, we have an outer cuticle. Then we have an epidermis. Then epidermis. Now this is a cuticle and this is the epidermis and below which we have the muscular layer. So there are three layers in the body wall. This is a muscular layer. So the outer cuticle is actually called a collagenous cuticle. Collagenous cuticle. That means the cuticle is made up of a substance. What is called collagen, a kind of protein. So it is an example of a parasitic adaptation. So it is suited for parasitic mode of life. This collagen cannot be digested by the enzymes of our body. For example, in the case of brown worm and present inside, that is in the intestine. So one of the parasitic adaptations for all the parasitic brown worms, they have a collagenous cuticle. Made up of collagen, a kind of protein, a fibrous protein we can 
getting sick. Then we have the next layer, the epidermis. So if you are taking the epidermis even in the case of fruit or in the case of animals, the epidermis is made up of normally cells. That means the cells product with the boundary lines. This is a normal epidermis. But in the case of these individuals, a peculiar condition, what is called we have syncytial epidermis. Syncytial epidermis. That means the cross walls are absent. The cross walls are absent. The cytoplasm is continuous with many nuclei. Now, this is a normal epidermis and that one is a syncytial epidermis where you have, there is no cross wall. The cross walls are absent between the nuclei and between the cells. The cytoplasm is continuous and also we have the multinucleate condition. The same condition you could see in the case of plants, for example, the fungal mycelium. There it is called sinocyte. I think so here the word Sinocytic Mycelia. So there also we have the cytoplasm is continuous without cross walls. The septum actually is absent. That is why the mycelium and the hypha is also called aseptate hypha or aseptate mycelium in the case of fungal forms. The same condition is prevalent in the case of round forms in the epidermis where there are no cross walls. We have actually the cytoplasm is continuous with multinucleate condition. So this condition is called a peculiar condition in the case of such bones, the rock bones. Then the third one, it is the first group which has developed the muscles for the first time. In the previous categories, there is no formation of muscles. It is the first group which has developed muscles in their body wall. And that the nature of the muscle is longitudinal muscle. So generally speaking in the case of animals, if you take for example earthworm, the body wall consists of two types of muscles. The body wall consists of two types of muscles. One is outer circular and inner longitudinal muscle. But in the case of this one, we have only one type of muscle, namely the longitudinal muscle. And that too, it is a first group which has developed the muscle for the first time in its body wall. Then, so again, uh, a slight advancement. So if you know that one in the case of evolution, there is a progress, a slight progress in complexity of organs. Actually, there is no real progress in the case of evolution. But we have developed more and more complex body designs from lower to higher animals. That is one of the concepts of evolution. More and more complex body designs have evolved from simpler to more complex actually animals, from lower to higher animals. Now the aluminum canal now it is complete, but it is in the form of a tube only without any digestive glands, but provided with a well developed muscular pharynx for this actually grasping the food inside. So anyway a tubular aluminum canal is present, but the digestive glands are not well developed in the case of parasitic forms particularly. So what is the reason why there are no glands, the digestive glands for secreting the enzymes in the case of these round bones, particularly the parasitic forms. It is one of the adaptations. As the animals are living, most of the animals in the industry as industrial parasite, they are absorbing the food which is already in digested form. They are getting only the instant food, the one which is already digested. That is why there is no need for them to break them further. So they have no digestive glands to secrete enzymes for further breakdown of the food because the food is already digested. It is in instant form. That is what happened in our digestive system. Now the excretory system. So it is performed by actually a system of tubes. In some cases we have what is called remnant cells. Remnant cells. Normally we have a tube system. The tube system is more or less in the form of H-shaped tubes. Or the remnant cells are found in the form of H-letter arrangement. That is why we can see the tube system or excreta system is in the form of H-shaped structure. So it is in the form of long tubes or in the form of some specialized cells, what are called the remnant cells, just like the flame cells, responsible for the excretion of the base materials. And regarding the sense organs, though the animals are living inside the actually industry, but normally in all cases we don't have any peculiar specific respiratory organs and circulatory systems. No circulatory system, no respiratory systems normally. 
The animal is respiring mostly by anaerobic method in the case of parasitic forms. If it is a free living form, it respires by means of what is called aerobic method. Then, a peculiar condition related to the sense organs. Now, in the case of roundworms, if you are taking specifically, there are two different types of sense organs. One, the aphids. Another one, the phasmids. Aphids and phasmids are the two types of sensory structures found in the case of roundworms. Now, the aphids are actually the chemoreceptors concerned with the feeling the sense of smell. And located just in the mouth within between the ventrolateral lips in the case of roundworm. In the case of normal roundworm, we have three lip to condition the mouth. Now, these chemoreceptors concerned with the feeling the sense of smell of the food are actually located at the anterior end of the body, particularly in the mouth in between the two lips, namely the ventrolateral lips. Now, the another one fascinates it is found towards the posterior end of the body. It is sensory as well as glandular. The first one is purely sensory, a chemoreceptor concerned with feeling the sense of smell, whereas the fascinates are actually glandular sensory structures. They are both sensory and secreted in function found at the posterior end of the body. And these two are very important in examination point of view. The aphids and phasmics formed just what in the case of long bones, the sensory structures. Now the sexes are separate. So that means the dioecious condition. Or we can say what is called unisexual condition. Unisexual or dioecious. So male and female animals are totally different. They exhibit what is called a sexual dimorphism. So, the sexual dimorphism means you know that on the somatic differences, the somatic or morphological differences between the male and female sexes, even we are including, for example, the anatomical differences, physiological differences, also coming under this category, but specifically the morphological differences or somatic differences between male and female sexes is called sexual dimorphism. So, here the females are normally longer, females are longer and the males are short. Then you can also differentiate the males by some other characteristics. Normally, the females are straight like this. The female body is straight. And whereas the males are, the post end of the males are curved like this. The post end of the males are curved. So this is another morphological difference by which you can differentiate the male and female individuals. So we will see later another Round bones or common round bones as carries. So, anyway, the male and female animals are different. Now, about the fertilization. So, it takes place inside the body of the female. Fertilization is internal. And the development is direct or indirect. So, I am using the word development is direct or indirect. So, I mentioned all in the case of platforms. If we are saying the development is direct, there are no larval stages. The young one is resembling that. But the only difference they are smaller in size. It is nothing but a miniature of the adult. But in the case of indirect development, the young ones in no way resembles the adult form. So normally, for example, the caterpillar larva of a, that is a butterfly or the tadpole larva of frog. So whenever you see the indirect development, that means in that animal there is a larval stage. So in some of the animals, we have a larval stage that is indirect development. In some others, the development is direct. There are no larval stages. And normally, we can classify the organisms based on the nature of the actually the reproduction. Some are capable of laying the eggs. So, here in this case, a majority of organisms are oviparous because they are laying eggs. For example, the common round book of human industry as caries lumbricoides. It lays eggs only. But in the case of the phylarian bone, called as Pocheraria bangrafti, a phylarian bone, so it is oviparous, or we can say viviparous. So they are giving birth young ones. So in the case of oviparous, egg laying. In the case of viviparous, directly giving birth young ones. In the case of oviviparous, eggs are actually released. But already the development has been completed inside the egg. As soon as the eggs are released into, actually as soon as the eggs are released from the body of the organism into the environment, 
instantly, immediately the M1s are hatched out. And that condition is called ovoviparous condition. The best example, we have the filarial worm or Ocheraria bankrafti. Now, some of the worms form in our human body. So, some of the worms are found in the intestine. Some of them are found actually in the lymphatic system. And some of the are found just actually buried or found embedded in our connective tissue, in the body of connective tissue. Actually, in the connective tissue, just uh, they are found embedded. So, accordingly, we have some of the examples of Ascalmendus. So, the one we have the common round bone, Ascaris lymphoidus, is always found in groups in the body, the industry, particularly in the case of children. It causes a disorder also, you know, that one Ascariasis. So, we are adding the suffix. A is ascariasis, the disease caused by the particular bone. Now, the next one, book bone, ancillistoma duodene. It is an intestinal bone. So, the first one is intestinal bone. The second one is also intestinal bone, that is ancillistoma duodene. And the third one, the pin bone, having a small hook like structure formed at the posterior end of the body, enterobius vermicularis. It is also an intestinal bone. So, the first three are called the intestinal parasites found living in the human intestine, either the hook bone or the pin bone or even the common round bone. Then there is a peculiar bone, it is not found either in the blood actually or in the intestine but found in the lymphatic system and that is the filarial bone. So the filarial bone, Ocheraria bangrofti, after the name of the two scientists, Ocheraria and bangrofti. It is named so, that is Ocheraria bangrafti. So it is found in the lymphatic system, in the lymph vessels. Even it is not found in the blood, it is actually entering into the bloodstream only during the night time. You will see later about this one. So it is a bone formed in the lymphatic system. And the first three, the intestinal parasites. The next one, guinea bone, the highly dangerous one. You see that one, dragon plus medinensis. And it is normally found in, just actually found embedded in the connective tissues, even found embedded in the muscles, even found embedded in the synovial cavity, causing much damage. You know the meaning for synovial cavity? The cavity formed in a synovial joint between the two bones at the place of joint. And where you have a fluid, synovial fluid, in the fluid the bone enters and causing damage too. The synovial cavity. So, the guinea bone is found embedded in the connective tissue. It may be a muscle, it may be some other connective tissues, or it may also be present just in the synovial cavity, a highly dangerous one. It cannot be cured by means of medication. It can be removed from the body only by means of surgery. That is about the nature of this guinea bone, a highly dangerous. And a smallest bone living in the eye, a round bone, what is called lower lower. This is the smallest round. It also causes some sort of actual additional damage, infection to the eye. So these are some of the examples of the round bones, the common round bones, what we have just in our body, the parasitic round bones. We have also some round bones which are free living, which are free living. For example, eel bone, one bone, commonly called as a eel bone. It is also a round bone, but it's a free living bone. And also, in one round bone, which is actually non-pathogenic, where you have the genome project has been completed. So, we, we know that one we are studying later in genetics, human genome project, the one, the mega project, what we have just actually conducted, was conducted by uh, the United Nations of America, the US Energy Department, National Institute of Health. So, what is human genome project? Nothing but actually program to understand the genetic composition and the genetic instruction that make up humans. Then we have to sequence the various actually the genes, the nucleotides, the DNA found in your body, and that project is called human genome project. You'll see in detail in 12 standard. And in one round row, Ceno rabbitis. In one round row, Ceno rabbitis. So this is also another round bone, just we will see later. So in the case of the Ceno-Rabbitis bone, 
The genome project has been completed along with the human. So their goal is non-pathogenic synoprabitis, both a non-pathogenic bone in which also the genome project has been completed just by human genome project. Now, let's take the example and the life study of this Ascaris lymphoides. Now, it is a monogenetic parasite in contrast to the tape. A monogenetic parasite is the one which completes its life cycle only in one host. It completes its life cycle only in one host. If you are taking tape home, it is an example for diagenetic parasite. It completes its life cycle in two hosts, for example, man and pig or man and cat. And if you are taking, for example, the smallest tape home, a echinococcus, it completes its life cycle in two hosts, for example, man and dog. Or if you take plasmodium, it completes its life cycle in two hosts, namely man as well as uh, that is the female anaphylus mosquito. And likewise the filarial bone, it is also a diagenetic parasite. It completes its life cycle in two hosts. So, now Ascaris lymphoidus, then even Entamoeba, these two are considered as the monogenetic parasite. Because these two parasites have completed the life cycle only in one host, the best example for monogenetic parasite. Now, one question related to the examination point of view, what is the nature of excretive product in the case of Ascaris? So it is actually urea. The waste product excreted by roundworm is urea. And based on the nature of the waste product eliminated, we can have the classification of animals into ereotelic animals, ammonotelic animals, uricotelic animals. That is based on the nature of the waste product they have excreted. So the waste product in the case of roundworm urea. That is why the animal is called ureotelic animals. So this is one examination question so far asked. Then another one. So regarding the nature of the reproductive organs in the case of roundworms as cats. Now the males have only one testis. Such a condition is called monarchic condition. Presence of only one. Normally we have a pair of testis in the case of animals. But here only one. If you have only one out of the two then the condition is called monarchic condition. So the testis exhibits monarchic condition. That means presence of only one test. It is also an examination point of view question. And another question related to the nature of the sperm. So in most cases, nearly 99.9% of the cases, in order that one the sperm is able to move, having a head, tail, etc. It is metallic. But here there is a peculiar condition. The sperm is normally amoeboid like. This is a sperm of round bones. This is a sperm of round bones, so it is amoeboid. Unlike the normal conditions, namely the tail condition, the motile condition, we have the bones are normally amoeboid. And about the ovaries, we have a pair of ovaries in contrast to the number of testes. So all these things actually relate to the examination point of view. So presence of one test is named in the monarchic condition and presence of amoeboid sperms in the case of male. And presence of two ovaries, a pair of ovaries in the case of female. Then about the nature of the development, about the nature of the development, again, so normally we have the infective stage is nothing but embryonated egg. So at the stage of some sort of embryo inside the egg, the egg is released. And now the water and food being contaminated with what is called embryonated egg. So the infective stage of man is embryonated egg. So some sort of development is already completed inside the egg. And this stage the egg is released from the human body. That is namely the primary host, only one host. And now this egg is the infective stage. When the food or water or anything is contaminated with this egg. While the child is consuming that water or food, immediately and instantly this egg enters in the body. And what will happen? Normally, the eggs are released along with the feces. Now, the animal undergoes development and metamorphosis. There are four modes. The number of modes in the case of round four. The number of modes four. The first mole has been completed in the soil. So that when the egg is formed in the soil, already the first boat is completed. We have seen the first flower. Now we have, now the, actually, 
the condominate food has been consumed. Now after completing the first mode, now the egg is inside the body of us, that is man. Now it reaches the intestine. It never stays in the intestine. The animal shows what is called extra intestinal migration. That means for completing its development, before completing the development, it reaches different organs starting from intestine to liver, liver to heart, heart to lungs, lungs to pharynx, pharynx to mouth. Once again through the esophagus and stomach it reaches the intestine. This is what we can say extra intestinal migration. I mentioned here. The duration of the migration is about 21 days. So once after completing the first mode that is in the soil, once it has been consumed by a person, now it reaches the intestine. From intestine, it reaches the liver, liver to heart, heart to lungs, lungs to pharynx, pharynx to mouth, then through esophagus and stomach, once again it reaches actually the intestinal region where it stays, the normal place for the normal growth and development. And also the place of what is called accommodation. So the time duration for the extra intestinal migration is about 21 days. The organs visited are the liver, then the heart, the lungs, pharynx, and then mouth, and followed by esophagus, stomach, and finally the intestine. And during the course of this extra intestinal migration, the animal has completed the remaining three modes. So the first two mold in the soil that is called the first larva. Now we have the second and third moles in the lungs. The second and third moles in the lungs. Sometimes it may be given lungs and ampullae. The name of the larva is called the abitive form larva. Now after reaching, that is the intestine, it has completed the fourth mode. So we have first larva, the abitive form larva. It is also called the second larva. And finally, after completion of the fourth mode, it becomes the adult. So anyway, don't forget the nature of the molting. First mold in the soil, second and third in the lungs are annual like or simple lungs, the fourth one in the intestine. The number of molds required, that is four, and then the animal went on actually migrating the different places and before it reached what is called the intestine, and that is called extra intestinal migration of 21 days. Now the next one, so these are some of the examples I mentioned already. We have the female is always longer and straight. The male is shorter in length and the posterior end of the male is curved. And also you could see. So in the case of female and male, we have the mouth at the anterior end. So the question paper also they ask about the location of this one, the order of a sequence of the appendix. So in both the cases, the mouth is located at the anterior end. And just behind the mouth, we have another opening. And these openings are actually both made together, just each one excreted it over. The opening concerned with excretion, excreted over. Now in the case of me, there is no separate what is called anus and then reproductive aperture. We have only one common aperture at the posterior end, what is called the clavicle aperture. This is another difference. So, if you are taking the male and drawing that is a larger one, so this is a clavicle aperture, and in the clavicle aperture or from the clavicle aperture projecting a pair of spicules like this. This is a spicule. And these spicules are called copulatory spicules. So in the case of males, at the posterior end, there is a single aperture for the elimination of reproductive as well as waste materials. And projecting from the opening, we have a pair of just what is called the spicules for copulation, hence the name actually copulatory spicules. But in the case of female, we have here the mouth, then we have the excretory pore, then there is a separate genital aperture and anus. Now the genital aperture is formed just about one third from the anterior end of the body, just behind the excretory pore, and the anus is located at the posterior end. So in female, we have mouth, excretory pore, genital pore, and then anus. This is all of arrangement of openings. 
Now in the case of men, they have more excretory pore and only the third opening, cleocular aperture at the posterior end. This is also another difference between the male and female round bumps. So morphologically they are different just based on the location of different openings and also the length as well as the posterior end nature. Now, so another note of economic importance, we have Ocherere Bankraft. So, under the name of two scientists, Ocherere and Bankraft, these were the two scientists, Ocherere and Bankraft, they normally discovered this book, hence it was given the name Ocherere Bankraft. Commonly known as a filarial boom because it causes a filarial fever or filariasis. So unlike the other round bones, it inhabits in northern part the lymphatic system and the lymph vessels and the lymph glands. Lymph vessels and lymph glands. So normally, it is a diagenic virus because it has two holes. So unlike the round bone, that is common round bone ascaris, there is a monogenetic parasite. Now this one is a diagenic parasite because it completes its life cycle two holes. The primary host we can have man, unlike the malaria parasite. In the case of malaria parasite, the primary host is female Anaphilus mosquito, man is secondary host. But in the case of this parasite, it is a diagenetic parasite. Here man is the primary host and the secondary host is nothing but the Culex mosquito, Culex pipiens and Culex faticans. I mentioned only one, that is also another species of Culex, Culex faticans. And these two are actually responsible for the transmission of the disease and also acting as the secondary host. Now, during development, this bone produces juvenile bones, the young bones. The name of the young bones, microphylari, this is of a examination point of view, importance, that is microphylari. So, microphylaria not that is because we have the name of the disease phylaria or phylariasis, but here also we have the name microphylaria. It doesn't refer to the disease, but it refers only the young worms of the parasite, the juvenile worm, namely microphylaria. So, a specific character is shown by this microphylaria, the larva. The microphylaria larva shows a specific character, what is called nocturnal periodicity. You know the meaning of periodicity. So specific duration, even we have the long wave plants, short wave plants, day neutrals, according to the light requirement. This is what is called the periodicity, periodism, photoperiodism. So like that here the animal shows nocturnal periodicity. That means the larva is always staying there during the daytime or retreats in the lymphatic system. It retreats or stays in the lymphatic system during the daytime. So it comes to the bloodstream, the peripheral blood vessels, only during the night. And that is called nocturnal periodicity. It stays there in the lymphatic system and during night actually it enters into it enters into the bloodstream. Now this I mentioned already. So the culex pipiens, that is a mosquito, a culex mosquito. We have different types of mosquito. You know that one, it is Egyptian, Anaphilus, and culex is one type. We can differentiate normally the culex and Anaphilus mosquito by its sitting posture. So normally the Anaphilus mosquito is being, so this is what we call, sorry. this is what we call this one. So this is Anaphilus mosquito, you can identify by its sitting posture. You can differentiate, you can identify whether it is a Culex mosquito or what is called Anaphilus mosquito by sitting posture. Now this Culex mosquito is always being seated on the substrate, parallel to the substrate like this. So this is Culex mosquito, this is Anaphilus mosquito by sitting posture, one can identify whether it is a Culex or that is, that is what we have is Anaphilus. Now, so we have the secondary host is female culex pipiens and someone asked about what is the name of the first and third larva. So normally there is no specific name, only the first larva, second larva like that one. And the second larva is called the diabetiform larva for the round bone. There is no specific name for the first or third or fourth. 
case only they are called as larva. That's all. The larva is called rapidiform larva. That the second stage of larva is called what is called as rapidiform larva. Okay, now let's proceed. So here anyway, this culex is nothing but a mosquito, a transmitting agent, actually responsible for transmitting the parasite. It is a vector. It is a vector for the disease, namely the filaria. Just like anaphylaxis, a vector for just what we have is malarial parasite. So we have a number of vectors, let's say in the case of arthropoda. Now coming back to this one. So the juvenile worms, the young worms are called the microphylari. They exhibit nocturnal periodicity. The meaning for that one, they stay in the lymphatic system during the daytime and comes to or enters the bloodstream only during the night. That phenomenon is called nocturnal periodicity. That is why the purpose of taking actually the blood sample for testing the malaria during night time is because of its nocturnal periodicity. So we are taking the blood sample for testing filaria during the night between 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. This is also an important question. So this is because of its appearance. So we cannot take the sample of leaf to test the parasite. It is impossible. It is also actually not possible and uh, somehow some also um, not appropriate. So you can take the blood sample only for testing the presence of the parasite. So that is why we have to take the blood sample during the night time between 10 pm to 4 am to test for filaria. Because of the nocturnal periods, periodicity, the character exhibited by the microfilaria works. Now, what is the name of the disease caused by? So, there is no specific reason, but actually, the adult worm is normally living in the lymphatic system and the conditions favorable actually available in the lymphatic system and want to get nutrients and want to relax themselves, want to approach, want to just actually one of the reason for the entry into the bloodstream it is a natural adaptation. So only they are entering the bloodstream. If they are being bitten by, for example, any insects, any example, culex, then only they can be transmitted. So the main purpose of entering into the bloodstream is for their mode of transmission. Because they cannot be transmitted easily from the lymphatic system. Because the mosquito is feeding mainly on the blood, sucking the blood only. So while actually the animal is sucking the blood, along with the blood, the parasite enters. So it is a natural phenomenon. It is one of the adaptation for spreading of the parasite. That is why the parasite enters into the actually the lymphatic system during daytime as normally the animal is not so active. It stays there, it retains in the lymphatic system. Okay now. So the filarial worm causes a disease what is called filariasis, also called Bancroft fever. This is also called Bancroft fever. Bancroft so, filariasis is also called Bancroft fever or we can have another disease, Cocheriasis or Elephantiasis. That is an enlargement of the leg. That condition is called Elephantiasis or another another scientist, it is also called Cocheriasis. So, filariasis or Bancroft fever, Cocheriasis or Elephantiasis. Now, what are the major symptoms for these diseases? What are the major symptoms? So I now I can give just three major symptoms. One, just what is called lymphoedema. So the word edema refers to you know that what accumulation of fluid in the intestinal space. So lymphoedema, when fluid accumulates, when the lymphatic system is actually blocked by this parasite, when the lymph vessels are blocked, then there is what will happen, the accumulation of fluid, particularly in the lymphs or in the mammary glands, or in the scrotal sites of mammals, sorry, the male individuals. So, we have the enlargement of the mammary glands, or the scrotal sites happens because of the blockage of the lymphatic system by the parasite that resulted in accumulation of the fluid and that is called lymphoedema, enlargement of the mammary glands, scrotum and also that is we have the lymph, that is the lymphs, even the hands and lymphs are also we have very small. Then, the second symptom of lymphangitis. lymphangitis. This is nothing but the inflammation of the lymph vessels. So the first one, accumulation of fluid, 
the stagnation of the fluid because of the blockage, obstruction of the lymphatic system by the parasites because they are found in large numbers. And the second one, lymphatitis, the inflammation of the lymph vessels. The third one, lymphadenitis. Lymphadenitis. This is nothing but the inflammation of the lymph glands, for example, the lymph nodes, the thymus, the tonsils, all being affected. These are all the lymph glands you have in the body, thymus, the lymph nodes, even the tonsils, and all being affected. So, anyway, we have either lymphoedema, or lymphadenitis, or lymphadenitis. These are all the major symptoms of this filarian bone. So, it is a parasitic bone. So, filaria is caused by normal filarian bone and malaria is caused by a protocytic parasite. You make a difference between these two. Okay, so with this I conclude this uh, ascal I will proceed towards 